Hi Ian, welcome back to Italy and welcome to Lina Rock. A new wonderful album is uh, finished and ready to be released. Let's start from the present, Homo Ereticus, with the return of the character of Gerald Bostock, mainly for the lyrics. Please tell us more about this special collaboration. Well, Gerald Bostock is a, is a writer's tool. He is a, an alter, alter ego. Uh, for me, he can say things that I can't really say. He's, uh, he's a voice that is independent and he can make characters and talk about people in a way that I can't because I'm sometimes I don't have the same, I don't share the same beliefs as Gerald Buster. So he's, he's useful as a character, but you know, he's as real as Harry Potter or Peter Pan. In other words, he's not real at all, but that doesn't matter because I think people love to have a little fantasy character, someone they can follow and relate to. And he's a little continuity there with Gerald Bostock in 1972 as a little boy who wrote lyrics and Gerald Bostock today who is age 52 and uh, a left-wing politician who uh, decided to write some rock lyrics again. Musically speaking, we could get uh, some inspiration from the early albums uh, in uh, some riffs or tracks like the Pax Britannica or uh, Meliora Secomore. Could you please explain in which sense could we consider Homo Ereticus as the third part of the concept Ficus Brick? Well, it really, in my mind, has nothing to do with Ficus Brick 1 or Ficus Brick 2. It's not, it's not the third part of a trilogy. It's an album really entirely on its own. It's only in the backstory to the album that we meet our old friend Gerald Bostock, just for five minutes. But really it's an album which is about looking from the perspective of history to look at more recent times and maybe to look a little bit at the future. So it's a way of talking about, a way of looking, making history help us understand the world we live in today. And uh, if I remember well, this is the very first time you use a Latin title for an album. Well, there's lots of Latin in the English language, and it's a language that um, that I had a little um, academic awareness of when I was at school. I had to study Latin only for two years, but it was enough to learn some appreciation and respect for a an ancient language that is very important in Britain because of course it was part of the Roman Empire in uh, in the period of a few hundred, well for a, a few tens of years after the time of Christ but it left its imprint on our country with lots of names. London is Londinium, yes. an old uh, outpost of the Roman Empire. Let's talk about Stephen Wilson, the, the young wizard who collaborated with you as a producer in the recent years on your last works, and also remixing old classic albums like Benefit or Fick as a Brick. You are a sort of idol for him, but how did you know, did you knew about him and how did you met? Did it maybe start a friendship and then developed in an artistic relationship? I think it's um, it's because I read somewhere in a magazine or maybe somebody told me that this guy called Stephen Wilson of Porcupine Tree had done some remixes of some King Crimson music. Karan. And um, so I suggested to EMI Records when they asked me who should do the 5.1 surround mixes of Aqualung three or four years ago. Yes. So I said, why don't you try this guy, Stephen Wilson, and see if he's um, interested. So that turned out to be the case. Stephen did one or two tracks and sent them to me, and I thought he had a good, um, respectful view on how to remix the music. And so he, he did all of Aqualung, and then... Um, and then uh, he did uh, Thick as a Brick, Benefit, uh, and then Benefit, and, uh, and Passion Play is coming out in June as a Great. 
as an album, and of course he mixed, he did the mixing of Thick as a Brick too. So, I mean, I've spent many hours in Stephen's studio working with him, and he's, uh, you know, he's a calm, quiet, sensible guy. Nice, know, nice yeah. guy, <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Being a musician, composer, perfor performer, producer for about 50 years now, you carry the big responsibility in changing people's lives, numbering millions. And you inspired more than a generation of artists. You were a pioneer. Since the 70s, your look and that particular style in playing flute that you actually invented got emulated. How did you feel about it back then? And how do you live it now? Well, it's important to know that I'm not the guy who invented the flute in rock music. There were lots of people back in the late 60s, early 70s, who, who uh, played the flute in pop and a little bit in rock music. It's just that maybe I was the guy who gave it a more prominent role. I gave it the, the role of equality with the electric guitar as a forceful lead instrument. But I wasn't the only guy who played the flute. There were three or four other people around that I remember at the time who Chris Wood from Traffic and uh, um, Ray Thomas from the Moody Blues. Moody Blues. Um, and then soon after I started playing, we heard of uh, the Dutch band Focus, who had a flute player. Focus. And Peter Gabriel used to play the flute when, in the early days of Genesis. But the difference, I suppose, was I was the one who made it more of a dominant force in in, in rock music. So after all these years, um, you know, I'm probably the guy that's best known for playing the flute in the context of rock and electric folk music and the various eclectic forms that I have used in my music over the years. So, but I'm not the only guy. You know, I'm just the loudest. <laughs> the loudest. <laughs> Okay. You share the stages and recording studios with so many musicians, with and without Jeff Rota. From Tony Iommi to Maddie Pryor to Rich Blackmore, Bruce Dickinson, Derek Schulman, and so on. Would you tell us some very special memory about some one of them? Oh, I could, <laughs> I could tell you lots of special memories, but one of the ones that's um, where there's a lot of. Um, uh, recording of history, which is incorrect, is that Tony Iommi was not really a member of Jethro Tull. He was a member of a band called Earth, who later became Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath. And uh, we played in a, I think, in a university in England where Earth were the the opening band. And you know, I thought Tony was a really simple, good, strong guitar player and um, Before Martin, uh, and we <laughs> asked him to come and uh, play with us just as a little experiment. Uh, he was interested to, you know, come for an afternoon and we spent an afternoon I think in a studio somewhere playing together and I felt that he was a, you know, he was a pretty good guy, nice man, but probably not the right guitar player for Jethro Tull for a number of obvious reasons, which one of which is that Tony has damage to his fingers from an accident yes. working in a factory. So he can play the way Tony Iommi plays, but he he couldn't play some of the things that I was asking him to play. I, I, I remember this the song I was trying to teach him was a, a new song I'd written called Nothing Is Easy, which was uh, on the Stand Up album. And um, I was teaching him you know, the chords, but it was really hard for him to play the way that I played, you know, with the particular chords and inversions, it was wasn't really his thing. So um, he uh, then helped us out. Just for one day, he came in. Uh, I think the, in December or around Christmas of 1967, he came and played on the. Uh, sorry, 68, Christmas yeah. of 68. He came and played on the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, Service. where he he. Um, Pretended to play the guitar. It wasn't. He wasn't playing live. He was just miming. There's a video too on. Yeah. Yes. So you have you you see pictures of Tony with his hat pulled yes. down because he didn't want uh, 
I think he didn't want Ozzy to know that he was, you know, <laughs> doing something else. So Tony sort of kind of lo looking down like this, playing playing the guitar. Just just for that was the only appearance, public appearance with Jethro Tull that Tony did. But you know, he's he's a he's a he's a really nice guy, and the fact that he went on to be so successful with Black Sabbath and and. Uh, with the band that the, the guys that he was playing with when I first met him. I mean, that, that was a, a perfect ending to the story. But it's not true that Tony was a member of Jethro Tull. He, he really, you know, we, we played together a couple of times just to, yeah. as you do Summary with musicians also. sometimes, you just kind of have a little fool around, see how things are. Do you mm -hmm. like each other? Do you have the same style? Is it, you know, there was no, uh, no more to it than that. Okay, go on with, with with this one. What about your relationship with your new record companies, the fantastic K Scope and Caliendra? How d how do your your power and influence in the business change after so many years, being such a legendary artist? Well, the the bulk of um, the work that I've ever done has been with uh, originally with Chrysalis Records which then was bought by EMI Records and then last year was bought by Warner Brothers yes. so we kind of ended up really where we started before Chrysalis Record because the very first Jethro Tull album I think in the second album too was with um, Island Records Island, yes. in the UK and Europe and with Warner Brothers, what well, the reprise label, Warner Brothers label in the in the USA. And then Chrysalis Records was born and they were able to uh, develop Chrysalis Records due to the success of Jethro Tull. And, um, and over the years, of course, the big record companies, there were quite a few 20 years ago. And now there are only three, yeah. and the, the music industry has changed in so many ways. But most of all, perhaps, in that the major record companies, their value is in their catalog. So I license my some of the catalog is owned by Warner, some of it is licensed to them. So I have to work with mm -hmm. Warner Brothers. I also have to work with Eagle, who mm -hmm. released DVDs of ours and. Like this one, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and then when I came to have a new album, um, before we started work on the album, I met with uh, three British record companies um, to discuss you know, the possibility of releasing something, and, and they all kind of made the same offer. They all made the same deal. There was no difference, really. Hardly any difference. Okay. And Warner Brothers were, were going to, they gave me the same deal as K-Scope, but I felt that probably with Warner Brothers, we would just be um, one of a thousand acts that they've signed up and bought from uh, EMI as well as the, the rest of the Warner Brothers catalogue. And, you know, we would be lost in the, something as big as that. So I thought maybe one of the um, smaller record companies that would give us a lot more attention might be a better bet. And since mm -hmm. Casco tend to specialise more in contemporary, progressive, and alternative rock music, it seemed that they might be the best people to work with. But um, my own company, Caliandra, is just a label, a label imprint on the. Uh, on uh, Casco, yes. but otherwise it would have been a label imprint on Warner Brothers. So it's, they but, work but you well. know, what is a record company these days? It's different to what it was before. But Casco actually are a proper little record company. They do have uh, quite a few people working there, and they do uh, they do follow the traditional model, but they do a much more detailed job, and they they know they can make good quality records with lots of different packaging and. Yes additional content and um, they're, they're never going to make tons of money but they make a you know nice little margin and everything is fine so <laughs> they care of the, that over, yeah. theater yeah. <laughs> <Bye>. okay <laughs> you've got a special connection with uh, italy and italian fans how would you describe it why is it so magic 
I think Italian fans are the culture, the um, maybe the stereotype is people who are very emotional. You know, they like to laugh, they like to cry. We can't feel. They like to. <laughs> they like to have battles in the streets. Uh, they're very politically aware and motivated. So they're you know people of great passion, and in some ways maybe like the Brazilians, you know, similar, very Latin temperament. The south of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, we are... Um, south of Europe. I, I can remember playing in Milan in the... probably in the... 72. No, 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 I'm, I'm talking much later than that. My son, I think, was about two years old when I played in Milan, um, and there were rioting in the streets and fights with police and tear gas everywhere. It During was the pretty 70s. scary. No, no, no. My, well, my son wasn't born until 1977. Uh, so mm. we're talking maybe 79 or 80. Yeah. But it was a, a, you know, a lot of violence around, a lot of um, um, f a mixture of strange uh, opposing forces of uh, extreme left and extreme right. And it's, uh, it's the story of today, too. People are very easily polarized. But, you know, the Italian people have learned by how much of life was wasted back then by getting involved in a rather naive way with idealism and uh, ideological politics. Now, I think people are more pragmatic. They, what they want is a decent job. They want to be able to save some money. They want to, you know, have, uh, have a future. And it's... Or simply survive. But in, but <laughs> yeah, mostly. I mean, most of the things that happened in Europe in the 70s have calmed down. You know, Berlin was a crazy place, and uh, in Milan and Rome it was a bit crazy. But you know, we had problems in London, problems in many cities of the world, and it uh, it's got a better, better place in more recent years. But we did have a couple of riots in. England in recent years, it's still still there, still that extremist view and people get a little crazy and start demanding things and um, so it could happen again, it's just that I won't be in the middle of it. You know, back then people used rock music as a, um, you know, as a hostage, as something you could do to uh, try to persuade the, with the power of rock music to persuade other people to follow a certain political belief. And I remember having big arguments when I was asked to play a um, concert with behind me big the flag of the Italian Communist Party. And, and I refused to play the concert. Mm -hmm. Red flag. And <laughs> uh, but I was told that if I didn't play, they would kill me. So okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a little, uh, little nasty. Anyway, the situation has changed <laughs> after. Yeah, the situation is, for the moment, everything is fine. A few years back in Rome, you shared the stage with a great world famous band, which is an Italian pride, PFM. Which memories do you keep of that experience and collaboration? Uh, my friends. main memory is how unbelievably loud the bass player and drummer were. I mean, Franz and Patrick. It just um, you know, there's a. I, I play with a few people that have frightened me on stage because uh, they are so loud on the stage that it just makes. To me, it's it's kind of just too much. I, I don't enjoy music when it gets beyond a certain level. And Jethro Tull has always been quite a quiet band on stage. You know, we 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 work on the assumption that you play music so you can hear everybody. And you let the the PA system do the work, you know the big speakers out front. They 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 make it loud for the audience, but on stage I don't want it to be too loud. You know, I'm an I'm an acoustic musician. I, you know, drums hurt my ears. So uh, that was my memory. Was just wow, how loud these guys are. How can they hear what they're playing? You know, really probably hard. probably they can't. They're probably deaf because they played so long. They have to turn it up really loud to hear it at all. But I had the same thing with. Um, 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 American blues guitar player, that um, young guy ish as he was. Um, oh, name escapes me now. 
um, he covered a new day yesterday. Joe Bonamassa. Joe Bonamassa. Yeah, from Joe New York Bonamassa. City. Yeah, he's he's a very nice man. Yes. And um, and I, he asked me to come and play with him at Hammersmith Odeon, a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I went down for the sound check just to play with them a sound check, and then during the show. And um, after the sound check, my ears were were, were hurting, you know, from the volume. It's um, I couldn't believe how loud he was either. It was, a, I mean, not so much Joe, but it's just the other guys in the band seem to have this thing about being so loud. It's just uh, crazy. <coughs> anyway, Joe Bonamassa was born in '77, so he's a young guy. But you have to think that uh, uh, Franz uh, Di Ciocio, the PFM drummer, is uh, one year older than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he's a very powerful, very emotional, very dramatic drummer. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just for me, it's it's just um, it is just too loud, and I'm 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 not very comfortable playing at those levels. That, that's that's my big memory. The other memory I have, of course, is that you know they were very nice men. They were very uh, uh, musical. They have a lot of, a lot of, I suppose in Italy, legendary music, which is sometimes quite complex. And yes. You know, I had to learn some of their music, which um, was, um, you know, it's interesting to do, <laughs> as I as I do sometimes with other artists. I have to learn their music and try to try to do my best for them if they ask me to join them as a guest. Okay, a few questions. The title Homo Ereticus also reminds us about you spending a whole life on the road. I would like to know if uh, there is a place in the world that you will remember forever as the strangest or most particular or simply the most beautiful place you've ever been and why? Well, one of the places that I, that I do always remember, I played there maybe three or four times is a, a Roman amphitheatre um, on the shore of the Mediterranean in Israel. And um, apart from being very old, it, it's, it's very well looked after. It's, it's in very good, to, you know, for a very old stone amphitheatre, it's very good. And uh, in Caesarea, just north of Tel Aviv. But it's also, apart from being very old and very historical, it's also in the middle of a country which is a very new country in the sense of its history since the 40s. It's also a very controversial country because of its, uh, its position in the Middle East and its country with a few friends and a lot of enemies. So for me to go to Israel, even though there are many beautiful places to play in Jerusalem, to play in Caesarea, to play in one or two other ancient parts of Israel, it's a very emotional experience, but a difficult one because to go to Israel and perform as an artist uh, is very unpopular with a lot of people in the world who think that we should not be going to Israel to support uh, the Israeli government in their uh, intimidation of Palestinians and their occupation of the West Bank and so on and so forth. But my, my view is different. My, my view is I'm, I'm not there to, uh, to make money out of Israel. When I've been to Israel in recent times, I've no, I, I, I don't get paid. I donate all the money to charities for the education of Christian, Jewish and Muslim children, Palestinians. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm concerned to try and use my position in music as an artist to try and make a point that we can do something which is positive. And so, you know, although there are many people who are very angry that I performed in Israel, my attitude is, you know, if you don't go there, you achieve nothing. It's, just, it's not going to hurt. Does Netanyahu give a shit that I don't go to Israel? Of course he doesn't. He doesn't care whether I go or not. It means nothing. So I'm not punishing the Israeli government or its uh, its leadership or even the, uh, the the right wing or the orthodox element of, uh, of of Judaism. I'm not punishing them by saying I won't go. They don't care. It does nothing at all. I can achieve more by going to Israel, trying to make the point that there are many people in Israel who really, really want to have peace with their neighbors and who want to be part of a country that is unified. 
but it contains many Palestinian Israelis, many Christian Israelis, and many Jewish Israelis. So uh, I think it's more important for people like me to go to Israel and try to do something positive. Staying away achieves nothing at all. In fact, uh, religion and rock both require big faith and strong devotion. You recently defined yourself somewhere between deist and pantheist. Can you tell us more about it? Well, I could write a book about it, but uh, to <laughs> tell you in simple terms, you know, I'm not a Christian. I, I am a supporter of Christianity. Um, the bloody church. I'm not a again. socialist, <laughs> but I'm a supporter of socialism. I, I believe in a pragmatic socialism, but I also believe, believe in a benevolent capitalism. Um, these are not contradictory views, they're just practical. How, how do you achieve a balance? And for me, I believe in the, in the spiritual sense, I believe in the idea of a God. I believe in the idea of a God combined with the idea of an, uh, an overwhelming morality, a sense of goodness. But I can't call myself a Christian because I don't believe in the really? Jesus Christ of the Christian religion. I believe in Jesus Christ, the historical character. He was a Jewish revolutionary. He was an angry guy. I sing about him on the new album. Poor Ferox Adventus, the coming of the wild child. He's, um, he's an angry guy. Revolutionary. Yeah, but it was uh, really three or four hundred years after his death that he started to be um, used as the front man for a religion which is a very powerful and very positive religion. I, I, I'm, I support Christianity, absolutely. I do concerts in churches and cathedrals and I'm very pro-Christian, but I'm not a Christian. I'm also pro-gay, pro-gay marriage. But I'm not gay. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I am. I don't know for sure. I don't think I'm. I'm pretty sure I'm not a Christian. I, maybe I could be gay if I started again. But you know, age 66, it's probably too late. Most, most of most of my gay friends would say it's too late. <laughs> you know. so. You're very famous for both. How did you match your artistic career with the Salmon Farm's passion and business? Can you explain how they were one of the con consequence of the other in some sense? Well, in terms of the music, I've always enjoyed the idea that the fun part is when you go on stage or if you're in the recording studio, but the, the other part, which some people don't like to get involved with, the business part, the organization part, um, I, I think that's quite fun too. I sort of enjoy doing that. and. Since 1974, 75, you know, I took over the management of the band and the running of all the finances. I paid for everything, and I, you know, made made arrangements with the other musicians. So didn't they didn't take any financial risk at all? The risk was always my. You are the boss. <laughs> no, I wasn't just the boss. I was the investor. I was the I was the bank. Yeah, you know, um, I was the bank that could have had the same problems as banks in Britain and Switzerland, Ireland. Italy, <laughs> Germany, you know, it could have been a disaster. But I was the bank. I had to try to look after the finances, wh which, which I was able to do. So I've always found it quite easy to, to bring together the, the, the business side of music and the creative side of music. So for me to try to do something else that was creative in the sense that it was a new industry, it was about farming and farming technology, albeit in the sea, in the marine, in the aquacultural sense, combined with the idea of it being a business and employing 400 people in the farms and factories in Scotland, it was something that I felt was a good challenge to try to see if I could do that. And I, I did that for 20 years and it was you know, a very uh, rewarding part of my life to have achieved something outside of music, but it w they were the same same rules that I learned about music business, I could easily apply those rules to the idea of farming. 
but then because I had to do the the business side of that and learn about doing budgets and learning about tax and learning about payrolls and accountancy then that became useful to me also in the music business because things changed in the music business to where we could do things in a much more direct way with the advent of the internet so in the last 15 to 20 years it's been possible for me to do things that I couldn't do 30 or 40 years ago. Now, I just call my friend Mr. Google <laughs> and he, he, he directs me to an airline. I can buy my tickets online. I can get all the tickets for the band and the crew and book the hotels and in half the time that it would take me to communicate that to a travel agent, I can just do it. So I do it. But why salmons? I mean, they are more rock and roll than any other fish. Why did you pick them? Well, <laughs> salmon are kind of rock and roll because they because are because of the, the taste. Maybe. <laughs> well, you know, and and they're also they have a special quality. They are an anadromous species. They are born in fresh water, and they swim down to the sea in search yeah. of a better life. Yeah. So they are, if you like, the uh, not the Homo erraticus, but the. Uh, Pisces are erraticus, they are the wandering fish who go yeah. in search of something better and they find it in the sea and they find it in the sense that they can uh, grow big and they can be successful but then they come back to the place they were born in, back to that same river and they swim up there and they have really, really violent sex <laughs> Okay. and then they die. So uh, they're, they're kind of rock and roll, they're, yeah. they're a little bit... Um, you know, the sex, mm -hmm. unfortunately the drugs too, because in aquaculture sometimes you do have to use some medication to keep okay. your fish well, but so. but hopefully we didn't have to do that very often, so okay, that was yeah. okay. Sex, <laughs> drugs and rock and roll, that's yeah. Simon, yeah. <laughs> uh, Last question because of, of the time, and I choose, <coughs> just imagine that uh, after this busy, busy interview, first thing you'll do is going to a record shop. Which new record would you buy? Which artist or musical style would you pick? Well, I would probably go to the record store and I would buy the new album by Seth Lakeman, a British folk artist who um, uh, has made quite a few records in the last few years since, since he started. And um, I played with Seth. Uh, he was actually, no, he was a guest on one of our shows. And um, he's a very nice man, and he's a very talented singer, songwriter, musician. And I would go and buy his new record. I already have his new record, because he sent it to me last week. <laughs> Signed okay. to, to Ian, I hope you like my new record. But I feel guilty, because I'm getting it f without paying. Yeah. Do you think that his choice to become a musician was just a matter of, of DNA? DNA? or? Uh, or maybe you would have choose anyway, even if he was, I don't know, a, a salmon farmer son. <laughs> well, I, I think actually James doesn't think of himself as a musician. He, okay. he says he's not a dedicated musician. It's mm -hmm. not him. Um, it's not really in him to be a, a musician. You know, he said to me, I, I'm not like the other guys. I, I'm not passionate about it in the way that they are. I'm, you know, I enjoy playing, but not all the time. I just you know, something that's good to know and be able to do, but he said, I'm kind of more interested in the in the big picture, in the business side of things, the organization. No, so he, he it takes care of uh, marketing and uh, yeah, promotion. You know, I, uh, I think I think his uh, his interest is more in in the management, the business, the okay. agency, that side yes. of things. He doesn't really think of himself as a musician, but you know, he's been uh, as a musician, as a drummer, you know, he's he's yes. pretty good and he's helped me out over the years since he finished university. He came to work for me and um, most of the time he's working for me and my companies. But he, he does some other things with other people too. So yeah, he's part of the team, part of the team. Great. My daughter would be part of the team too, but she just formed a company last week with her husband and another famous British actor and they're, they're setting up a movie production okay. company oh. so I've lost her she's she's mm. gone to the enemy <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have to ask you uh, to choose uh, one of uh, the records and uh, to make uh, an autograph and uh, <laughs> someone 
Well, I, I, I can tell you my favorite. Okay, well then. And uh, I think about okay. the figures of break or stand up yeah. or... Uh, okay, which? Yeah. which? Stand up. Okay. <laughs> this one? Okay. This is not a if you up, want uh, this one, uh, maybe. Okay. Um, I don't mind, I've got my Sharpie, but I just don't want to no. make all these fall down, so... Don't worry. Okay. Mm -hmm. You, th this is the hardest one to do because it's very busy. Should I do on the back, on the white on the, part? On the back okay. is perfect. Yeah. My name is Mox, M-O-X. Okay. There you go. Thank Brilliant. You very much. I knew they'd all fall down sooner or later. <laughs> okay, I better go because I've got another three interviews to do tonight. Okay. So. Thanks so much. Thank you.